consternation and celebration for workers across the country. This week, we'll talk to SEIU International President Mary Kay Henry of the Service Employees and Labor Journalist Sarah Jaffe about worker wins, challenges, and some new models for organizing that are emerging one year into the Trump administration. Then Michelle Miller and Palak Shah on a new online platform that's helping labor activists and their supporters cooperate and win. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Are these the worst of times or maybe the beginning of the best of times for the labor movement? That may sound like an anti-intuitive question, but I think our next guests are up to talking about it. Mary Kay Henry is the president of the SEIU. Sarah Jaffe, longtime labor correspondent and a former colleague of mine. So welcome both of you to the program. It's great to have you. Um, does that frame sound all right to you? I mean, these are grim times in lots of ways. Let's start with the grim. Mary Kay, how do you see it? Well, I think it's um, not really about the labor movement. It's about poverty wage jobs and the idea that in the richest country of the world where we just gave the biggest tax cut in the history of this nation to the wealthiest and corporations in this country, while 64 million people are working three jobs and living in poverty, that is the worst of times. And uh, we think the American labor movement has to be a response to that in making it possible for people to join together, raise wages, and create good jobs in the service and care sector, which has always been excluded from labor unions, from law, from uh, the fullness of their ability to contribute to the economy and be able to raise a family. And you, Sarah, where do you see the worst of times? Just I mean, you know, the Supreme Court wants to um, take another big whack at labor protections for however many million workers in the public sector in this country, or that's on the back of, as we were just, Mary Kay was just talking about home care workers. The home care workers already got the hammer in 2014 with Harris v. Quinn. It's coming from the state houses, it's coming from the Supreme Court, it's coming from the Trump NLRB. Um, there's not a lot of recourse for working people in law at this point. You mentioned Janice B. AFSME. Yes. What's at stake there? What's at, at issue? Sarah, then Mary Kay. People think right to work means no unions. And we just saw in West Virginia that even a lack of legal collective bargaining rights at all doesn't mean no union. All right. Well, we'll get to what could happen. But as far as you're concerned, Janice B. AFSME is uh, one in the line of attack that's been happening for the last 40 years in a legal system that has been broken by the extreme right in cities and states and now the Supreme Court's getting into the act so that they can impact 7 million people all at once as opposed to 180,000 in Iowa that lost collective bargaining, got their wages reduced, or the half million in Wisconsin. And I think Sarah's right. The best experience we've had in the last 20 years in SEIU is workers have to organize in spite of the law. And we make new law by taking militant action and not taking no for an answer and through the fearlessness and courage of individual people that are willing to stick their necks out and have the guts to say, I deserve better. So this is getting us to the question of the best of times. Uh, in a sense, what we saw in West Virginia, and you were covering it, Sarah, so you can, you can tell us more, but what it seems like we saw was a lot of people saying, okay, we don't have the right to strike. We've lost this across the state already. We're still gonna strike. And we're gonna strike whether we have influential support or not, including from some of our unions. It's certainly a situation of the worst of times sort of getting people angry enough and frustrated enough and talking to each other enough that they said, you know, we're gonna take action. And it started with three counties and then my favorite part of the story, actually, is the three counties that went out, which are all the historic coal counties, Logan County, where Blair Mountain is, they voted to go out to take a day and go on strike and go to the Capitol and protest. And there were two other counties that had a snow day. 
So you have teachers who had a snow day. Theoretically, that means you should stay home. But they actually drove West Virginia Mountain Road to get to the Capitol to join this protest. You ended up with five counties. And then the rest of the state looked at that and said, well, this looks like fun. We can do this. And the outcome of the strike, Mary Kay, as far as you're concerned, what are your takeaways, not just from you know, inspiration level, but they really raised some wages, not just for teachers. You're right. It has created hope for the nursing home workers that are struggling with the same issues, trying to raise wages, employers that are trying to intimidate people that being in the union is not a good thing, uh, and our hospital members that have experienced the same thing. So the implication, in addition to raising wages, not just for teachers, but for the support staff and other parts of the community, is a sense of hope that when you join together and break the rules, you can actually achieve your goals and help things go better for the children that you care about. What do you take from that to, in your work now going forward? Like, is there something that changes about what you've been doing? There's been so many things like West Virginia that have made us think that we have to um, strengthen and protect our current members and activate them but we also have to invest more heavily in supporting the fearlessness and courage of non-union workers that are willing to join together and take advantage of other nursing home workers that watch the West Virginia teachers and think, hey, maybe I should form a union here. So it's, it's sort of both trying to deal with the, the incoming attack, but use the attack to create, I think, more disruption. We want to create more disruption um, that allows for new organizations to be birthed all across the country. So let me just push you on this for just a bit, because SEIU has been very instrumental in a strategy of, of, of mobilization and sort of insurgency, I want to say almost like a cell level, like let's just sort of sprout protests in different places, you don't necessarily have to be majority in the workplace, don't necessarily have to be a strike, it's a kind of movement strategy of disruption. They took an approach to power that is very old school, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And maybe mm -hmm. is different from what you've been doing. Well, we've been trying to create national pressure on three multinational corporations, as opposed to a geography in a state. So we think of it as building over the, we've been in it for five years in the fight for 15. We intend to stay in it until we get the multinational corporations to a national table. We think it should build to the kind of scale you're talking about nationally, but that doesn't happen in one year or one election cycle, or it happens over time. And we're incredibly uh, excited that the $15 gains have been a way that for the parts of the country where there's been political blocking of minimum wage increases by white state legislatures against black city councils or in other parts of the country for other reasons, that those, those parts of our country feel hope when West Virginia teachers win or when New York and California and Seattle go to 15. And we don't think we can do it by ourselves as one organization, that it's going to take multiple organizations respecting and nurturing organic movement in addition to making sure that we use our political power in a way that pushes people to much bolder demands and expectations for what we have the right to expect. What are you asking labor leaders as you travel around the country doing your reporting, Sarah? There are so many questions, but right now, like one of the big questions, right, and, and I've talked to some SEIU folks from the West Coast, is sort of what is the preparation for Janus? Because again, right, right, right to work doesn't mean that your union goes away, but it does mean that workers now have an added option to opt out. Like what happened in West Virginia was you had a bunch of teachers who were members of the West Virginia Education Association, a bunch of teachers who are members of the AFT West Virginia, a bunch of teachers who are not members of a union, all acting like one union and going on strike. And that's not the same exact thing that you needed to keep your membership in right to work, but it is a similar feeling that you need the teachers you need the home care workers, you need the nursing home workers, you need the you know, social workers to feel like their union is them and not as like some third party that they pay a fee to. So how do you do that? Answer, Mary Kay? Well, we've been having this conversation since Friedrichs. I'm sure. So there's been a three-year internal campaign to help individual workers understand what's at stake. We That's should say Friedrichs was another case that threatened oh, to yeah. um, diminish the union's ability to extract or to charge dues of people on behalf of whom they negotiate. Great, thank you. And then 
This three-year campaign for us uh, res culminated last Monday when we had 600 job actions in public work sites across the country, which was the most our public members have ever done together on one day. And it was a way for people to taste what it was like across fee payer, uh, conscientious objector, and union member to come together and do something. I was in Lawrence, Mass. I walked out with Department of Family Services and the Department of Transportation, Department of Revenue. It's a state department inside the old mill where textile workers walked out 100 years ago, which is kind of unbelievable. You didn't invite me. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> and they, you know, they understood kind of what's at stake. It's they stand on the shoulders of textile workers that created that town and now are the remaining middle class in a town that is devastated by violence because of poverty. Uh, and it was chilling to me to understand that if we can help our public members make the connection that their destiny is linked to making sure that fast food workers and nursing home workers also have a shot at a better life, then we think we're going to build the kind of momentum off of doubling down and connecting with our members, but also saying there's a bigger fight here um, to not just maintain your wages and benefits, but to establish the next American middle class that includes everybody this time. The next American middle class may include an awful lot of robots. If Lawrence is the past, the future has a lot of automation in it. How are you thinking about that? And in the midst of so many fights right this moment, does having to think about that level of automation and that total transformation of the workplace, of work life, um, help or hinder us? Well, in the islands of strength that we have along the coast, we're trying to use our collective bargaining to make technology be the way that my mind is unleashed at the highest level in the work I do. So can technological disruption in the healthcare sector be something that allows every healthcare worker that's been ground down by routinous task to be unleashed to perform at a much higher level? That's one question we're trying to ask. The second is collective bargaining allows for a just transition. When automation is introduced that impacts my job, if I'm at a table with the employer helping think about the best way for that automation to uh, make patients care better, then it's better. We have to establish how a union can use automation to make work better for everyone. And then in the places where workers are getting displaced, I think we have to get ahead of this and talk about how are we going to have a just transition for truck drivers? How are we going to have a just, there's going to be major dislocation. And again, if we were organizing on a scale of millions more workers being able to join use, unions, I think we'd be able to make a huge impact and see technology as something that could advance the work experience and not simply dislocate us. That's the, we're having the wrong conversation, I think. And in the places where workers um, aren't scared because they have job security, they're willing to engage on how the technology should be used in a way that would make uh, work better for everyone. Have you been talking to Trump voters specifically around oh, any yeah. of those? Talk about that. Um, we've been specifically in the Midwest in uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, downstate Illinois, Iowa, uh, Ohio, trying to go to our members first and then communities where it was Obama, Obama, Trump. And the biggest question is what you wouldn't be surprised by, which is, when am I going to see myself in somebody giving a that my family's suffering to? And how are, you, how are you speaking to that pain? And how are elected officials, how are you making a demand on elected officials and candidates that the solution to our economic suffering has to uh, deal with all the different ways in which it, it has hit us? And the amazing thing in SEIU is we have white corrections officers in Michigan that can sit at the same table with black nursing home workers in Detroit, and they can understand that their fundamental unity is that they want their families to do better. And all the ways in which this politic is trying to divide us, we have to use our organizations to unite people across division and see their self-interest and their fate in, in building more power together. 
you talked about working with democratic electeds and politicians. You and the yes, well, you got a lot of grief for your um, early endorsement of Hillary Clinton. Do you have a, a litmus test, a, a checklist? Is, are there, uh, is there a, a threshold beyond which you will not go when it comes to endorsements this year? What are your minimum requirements this midterm year and then looking ahead? We have a national set of minimums, and then each of our members in states add their specific issues. So the three top things are we want every candidate to make it easier for workers to join unions, and we have a whole set of ideas about how that can happen. We want everyone to be committed to wages and a minimum of 15, and so the shorthand for that is they have to be public and do something on 15 in a union. And on health care, they have to be willing to protect and strengthen the Affordable Care Act and be for Medicare for all. And the third is common sense immigration reform. And so those are the three key issues that we're judging everybody. And then inside of each state, like the reenfranchisement of felons is a key issue for our Floridians. Uh, there's a criminal justice initiative that is emerging in Detroit. So those things get added to the city and state demands that our members and non-union workers, our members and non-union workers are joining together for the first time on the whole question of whether we endorse and what we do when we, when we endorse. Anything exciting on your agenda, Sarah? Anything particular? It is sort of the best of times and the worst of times, right? Because I'm either going somewhere because something bad is about to happen or talking to people because something bad is happening that we're trying to stop. There is all sorts of attacks on unions brewing state by state. And, uh, you know, in Florida, for instance, right, where they passed a bill to arm teachers after three union teachers were killed in, among the, the shooting victims in Parkland, they're also considering a, a bill like Scott Walker's. They also want to bust the union of the teachers that got killed trying to protect their students. Um, it's really convoluted. So, you know, it's, so it's... They won't need collective bargaining anymore. They have guns. <laughs> I mean, it is an interesting question when we're talking about teachers in West Virginia harking back to the history of the mine wars. If you think that they're trying to arm teachers and teachers are recalling the history of armed labor struggle and they're trying to bust union... I, this could be a little uh, terrifying here. They don't really want to go back there. Any final thought, Mary Kay? Just the inspiration I have about the fearlessness and courage of people that have propelled movement and organization and that we're in a particular moment where the ability for individuals to connect with each other is at an all-time um, high. And it does make me think about the questions you asked about given that phenomena and given that so many more people are rising up beyond the organization that they may be in, what more could I be doing as the president of a union or the institutional labor movement to add air and oxygen to that? Because the 35 was preceded by massive strikes and disruption, and I really think this is our moment to um, fan it, and we have to connect it to the fights for Black Lives Matter, for immigrants, with the environmental movement, because our members don't see their union as something that just deals with the wages, hours, and working conditions. Their union is a way to have a political voice. Beautiful talking to both of you. Thank you so much, really. Mary Kay Henry, Sarah Jaffe, what a pleasure. We'll check in with you in a, in a year and see whether it's been good or bad. <laughs> You're watching The Laura Flanders Show. Thanks. Well, we're here at the Platform Cooperativism Conference where we're fundamentally imagining new ways that technology um, can create an economy that works for all of us. And I'm excited to have Michelle Miller here, who's the co-founder of coworker.org, which is a technology platform that's fundamentally reinventing the way workers can advocate for the future that they deserve. So coworker.org is current, we're in our current iteration, um, a digital platform for worker voice is the sort of very pithy, uh, way that we describe what we do. We're the front door to labor organizing on the internet. So we provide campaigning tools um, 
through the platform and then strategic support through our staff to people who want to create change in their own workplaces. And the sort of functionality is that you create a campaign on coworker.org, we help you connect that campaign to as many of your coworkers online as possible, and then we build these uh, decentralized but digitally connected networks of employees who can start to think about how as a collective they can shift power inside their workplaces. Our largest and most active network is a network of Starbucks baristas. We have um, almost 40,000 baristas who've run 50 campaigns on the site. That's about 15% of Starbucks global workforce and they're distributed across about 30 countries. Um, and this, I think it's really important to talk about how this network actually got started. Three years ago, a woman in Atlanta, Georgia wanted to overturn the company's ban on visible tattoos. It was a small issue um, and most of the labor movement laughed at us at the time and said, why are you helping this woman uh, get visible tattoos, aren't there much more important issues going on at Starbucks? But we felt that it was important, one, to help workers wherever they are and with whatever issue they had. And we also knew that if they had the experience of collective advocacy actually working, um, and they started to build that muscle around organizing, that it probably would eventually lend to other kinds of campaigns, and that's exactly what happened. So Christy built a network of 15,000 of her employees. From there, that network has more than doubled on the platform Form and they've been winning things like wage increases, scheduling, um, other dress code reforms, all because they've been in this learning process of really figuring out where to push on power inside the company and see change. We actually built coworker.org in response to the ways in which workers were using those sort of private platforms. Um, there were lots of workers starting campaigns on change.org um, around changing some specific working condition or forming um, groups on Facebook. But in those circumstances, private companies own all of the data, they own all of the lists, they own the network that workers are building. And workers can't re-access that. That's like a one-time deal. You run one campaign and then all those names go back into some list somewhere. And in the Facebook example, you know, this is a private company that can shut down your private space anytime they want to. Um, and we've seen examples of, there were a group of Amazon employees who had a Google website and they were organizing through that Google website and Google just shut it down. Um, and they had to campaign to get the thing turned back on. So we have to be creating spaces that are owned by workers where they know that they can always come back and um, no matter what they're campaigning on and no matter who they're targeting, they're gonna be able to have a private independent space that they own. This is fundamentally about controlling technology because whoever controls the technology is gonna control our future. And we believe that workers deserve the chance to be able to shape their own future and technology is gonna play a big role in that. Our model is to just learn from workers as they go. And what we started to see really early on was one, that workers framed their own campaigns and the stories of what was happening to them. So there's a sort of inherent narrative uh, structure to the way that they're articulating campaigns. But what we've also seen is that workers make comments or engage in the campaign and become really great storytellers that journalists are actually hungry to hear from. And so when you can actually get that authentic story about what's happening inside a company, I think it really makes a difference in the reporting and it contains so much more than just the thing the worker's talking about. It often points to many other trends and patterns that are happening inside companies. So actually every coworker.org network has a media committee um, that are the people that tell the story of that workforce to journalists whenever they want to hear what's going on. The data is basically owned by the workers in the network. Um, so we've been experimenting actually with this idea that you could start to um, poll and survey workers within networks and identify frontline issues. So what we thought was, you know, we would take the same practices that pool data through surveys and polling and actually aggregate that and give it back to workers. You know, data is the, the currency right now of so many of these companies. It is the thing that they use to have power over us. And so what we're trying to do is like, return that the power of that data to the groups of workers. I think at this point 
um, the metrics will be we need a field of innovation. We need models like Coworker and hundreds of coworkers to emerge in the field um, so that we can actually figure out not how to mimic what Silicon Valley is doing, but actually take it and hack it apart um, so that we're building power for workers. If people want more information about us, they can go to coworker.org or they can email me at michelle at coworker.org. If you want more information about platform cooperativism and the movement to build people-powered people -powered platforms, you can visit platformcoop.net.